I am not sure if this is safe to watch, but whatever. Let's just do it live. How this anime trended number one all season dangers my heart from Mr. 414 Anime. Give it to me. How does an anime trend number one for eight weeks straight? Well, if you ask me personally, it how do you do that? How do you make an anime trend? And during the chart, I don't know exactly which chart. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I showed you the wrong thing. Basically, the first half was how does an anime, you know, trend number one. But I don't know which chart this is. I think that some, most of these charts are basically voted by a group of people that doesn't really represent a wider demographic. I think a lot of the anime polls are very rigged. Like... Whatever you see in Anime Corner, whatever you see in my anime list, whatever you see in any chart, whatever you see on the Reddit, subreddit, I feel like every one of them are, it's not a actually good representation of like what people actually do care about. But still, if it's still got number one all season, that's pretty impressive. How do they do that? Just good story? Just good rom-com. Dangers of My Heart genuinely is like really, really, really good rom-com where the progression is amazing and both the female and the main characters they are built up. One of, the one of my favorite things about this show is how usually what they do is the waifu is like a static, perfect character that is already complete. And she only exists to bring you the main character that you self-insert as and for you to come out of the shell. And sure, those, those shows are pretty good too. But the thing that I love about Dangers in My Heart is how Yamada keeps like opening up and shows her insecurities and vulnerabilities in season two and a little bit in season one. And it shows you that she is just... Another regular girl, too, going through her own problems. She's not this perfect, ideal, static character that's supposed to be, you know, the dom mommy that takes the beta main character and does shit in the other rom-coms. But I love Dangers in My Heart so far. Service. The I'm a lost cause and a dirty, dirty boy. I can tell. In reality, it's simple, really. It needs to be as hype as balls. It needs to shock you, appeal to a wide audience, and the presence of a top-tier waifu or... Just make good content. That's all you got to do, right? Just make good content. It helps. <laughs> Basically, any ammunition to get people spamming mid on Twitter. X. Whatever. Mid! The favorite... The, the funniest thing about the word mid is how it's been popularized to the point where people think mid is worse than bad. Mid literally means like average, mediocre, middle of the pack. It does not mean peak or bottom or like, you know, it's, it's just mid. Mid on Twitter. X. Whatever. Mid! But sometimes an anime doesn't need to be all that. Sometimes it simply just needs to be good and yeah. to excel at the basics. This just... Like, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to have a winning formula and trying to get controversy and trends, right? You can do a bunch of degenerate fan service. You can just create ridiculous hype. But what are those at the end of the day? They're just good anime. Sometimes it is a bait and it can't hold on its own. But if you're going to trend the entire season, that means that while there may have been a bait, the substance that people got baited into and kept watching for is actually good. This is exactly what the dangers in my heart does so well. That is how this anime trended above hype shows like Solo Leveling, Free Run, and the one about the- Yo! Dangerous did air this January, right? That was during Solo Leveling. That was! Gushy over my- And Dangerous exceeded? I don't know the exact- Really? It beat Solo Leveling gushing? That is genuinely impressive. On one hand, you have a ridiculous, perhaps overhyped- you know, webtoon uh, anime, which I love. Solo Eleven, we covered that really well on our channel. And it was very fun. And that's like the hype component. And Gushing for Magical Girls is just etchy, right? A lot of people purely just watch that because etchy. But despite those two gargantuans, Danger still kind of was higher in some charts because of how good the actual anime is. A girl doing horny things to magical girls. <laughs> This guy is so down bad. I love that show. The Dangers in My Heart is a romance and comedy story, and a lot of romance anime in recent times have been labeled as diabetes. Yes, diabetes in the worst fucking way possible, bro. Angel next door lives. Oh, fuck. He's like, we watched that and it was enjoyable, I guess, but oh my god, every episode is just like, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you too. Oh, you're so perfect. Oh, I love you so much. <laughs> Ugh. I hate that shit. 
Rom-com, I like it more when there's more calm than rom. And if you're going to have rom, don't make it so overly fucking cheesy like that. Dangerous in my heart, I haven't found the cheesy. I haven't found Dangerous in my heart like Angel Next Door. For whatever reason, when I watch Dangerous in my heart, I think there's more rom than calm. There is some calm element. But something about the way that the Dangerous in my heart does shit, it is actually so relatable as well. I'm like reflecting back on my maybe like middle school memories. It's just, just a good show. It's, you know, because they're so sweet. This term has been thrown around like Crunchyroll handing out awards to JJK lately, and that's simply because there are many top tier romance anime rolling out right now. Are there? But when it comes to the dangers in my heart, it really is different. Because of this romance anime, I'm now taking freaking insulin, because this anime has force fed me sugar directly into my bloodstream through my very eyeballs, thus diabetes. This also sucks because I'm a real man who can't handle needles. Mm. <laughs> needles! Okay. <laughs> so I need somebody else to give me that shot whenever I think about or watch this anime. Mom! Now, as mentioned, where the dangers in my heart's trending success comes from is the fact that it doesn't do anything different from your standard school romance anime. But what it does is take the- Was that Kotori there for a second? Hold up, hold up, hold up school romance anime but yes it's kotori this is the season one episode 12 or 13 the finale we, we went on a date and we're going down the slide i remember this of course i remember this what do you think i am but what it does is take the basics and then really excel at them so it pulls you in and this is done in three key areas let's hear Kinda it like my wife she cooks she cleans she sucks my <laughs> firstly the dangers in my heart that's it your wife just cooks, cleans, and sucks your dick. She's just basically just a maid. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's not a wife, that's just a maid. It's kind of like an underdog story in a way, and we're all a sucker for an underdog, right? This an underdog story. Yes, and let me get to that point. I think that a lot of these rom-coms are literal power fantasy for a bunch of fucking losers that's never had romance in their life that can't get bitches so that they can self-insert themselves into these loser main characters and they can dream about a perfect waifu that just comes out of nowhere and saves you. Not gonna happen in real life. Maybe one person out of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people. But this is my genuine take on most rom-com. It's just pure power fantasy for a loser demographic, marketed for a loser demographic, genuinely. Ichikawa, he was a loser in the beginning, for sure. But he, in the beginning, again, was super annoying, the killing, serial killing thing, the murder stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? But that was just a middle school kid in his chuny phase after all the shit that happened in his childhood, trying to cope. And as he slowly starts to process his feelings and tries to really try to understand what's going on, there's a lot of annoying moments where he deludes himself into thinking, no, 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 it's not what, there's no way Yamada actually likes me. But then it makes so much sense because he's trying to like justify and why that might be the case because he wants to protect his feelings, right? Everyone has related like that. I think I myself, if I was his age, I would totally do something like that. Ichikawa is like such a... Maybe not a lot of people think this, but I think he's a great main character for a rom-com. He started off really weak, and even now, he's a little, he's getting better for sure, but there is like a turning point where he decides to like actually move forward, and everything kind of like comes together by the time he gave the speech in season two, where at the first half, he just memorized the script, and the last half, he was like, what do I do? The whole pro part was through improv. He was like learning from all the experiences that he went through and about how you need to move forward and accept your losses, accept your failures and all that. Everything that he could relate to, he just said it to the audience and it was just so authentic, it was so genuine. And I love the progression of each guy from the beginning to now. And for no reason do I think that this is a show made for losers. Absolutely not. I've never felt cheap anything about that. Now. Does it, like, obviously there's some elements that a little kid like this is suddenly dating like a supermodel at middle school. Yeah, there is a bit of power fantasy. But if you really think about it, these girls too, Yamada, she's just a normal girl. She's just a normal girl that loves to eat. She's a glutton and she finds some comfort in Ichika and they get to know each other. And she realizes how much he actually starts to like actually care for him. She reminds him 
you know, he reminds her of the dad. It's actually very, very relatable. It makes a lot of sense. I love both the main and the female characters in this show. There's something about them that we just root for. We want them to win and to succeed against the yep. odds. But it wasn't like that with Ichikawa in the beginning. No, Most it wasn't. Most people couldn't stand him. They thought he... I couldn't either. I'm like, where the fuck are they going with this? And I think that they intentionally did this as somewhat of like a hook to make the audience be like, what the fuck is going on? Why does he want a serial kill, right? You need some kind of pull. I'm not sure if that paid off. In the beginning, I was like, what the fuck is going on? But obviously I stick with it because a lot of people glazed this show being one of the best rom-coms ever. So I had, you know, confidence that it would be better. But I wonder if a lot of people, when they first watched Dangerous in My Heart for the first time, they may have dropped him in the first earlier episodes because of what Ichika was like. He was really creepy and it turned a lot of people off the anime at first. I mean, he does look like a major creep, but who am I to judge? So this dude is super into serial killers and he says things like he's not right in the head and that deep in his heart he's a bit of a bloodthirsty killer, which yeah. are all things I'd describe my cat. Feeding time is no joke. Anyway, he turns his head towards main girl Yamada and to answer your question, bro, would you smash? Bro, come on. She's 14. Yep. <sighs> it is what it is. So Ichikawa turns towards her and in his inner monologue says that she is the one he wants to kill the most. And yeah, as far as- And that kill was basically, I want to be with her the most. As far as pickup lines go, I've heard worse. Now, this creepy, I need to find a way to kill her thing only really lasts two or three episodes before the big 180 from kill, kill, mm -hmm. kill, 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 kill two. To, oh, wait. Love. No, I think Adoration. I like this girl, actually. Like, yeah. Fuck. After this 180, we get to see the real side of Ichikawa and the actual story and premise of the dangers in my heart in how the more he spends time with Yamada, the more he wants to protect and be with her. Mm -hmm. How the serial killer thing was a front to protect himself from getting hurt and yes. that she is helping him come out of his shell by- The whole serial killer thing was just Chuni Cope. The private school stuff with his friend from kindergarten going off to different places, right? As he grows up and he's kind of isolated. He peaked in primary school and then he just, and then he became kind of like a neat, not, not really a neat, he's in education, but you know, he became like a shut-in and kind of cope with the serial killer stuff. A Yamada being, well, Yamada. The two are complete opposites. We mentioned Ichikawa as being creepy and introverted, whereas Yamada is outgoing. Going. She's yep. a beautiful model and actress and she's a bit of an airhead. It's not only an underdog story where we're backing Ichikawa to get the girl way out of his league. You got this dog? But yeah, she is really out of his league. But sometimes, and, and that's just in terms of just pure looks though, right? But what is, uh, he's not even that bad looking to be honest. Once he got the haircut, bro, just give him a little bit of height. Just give him time. He's actually an Ikemen. He's just Squirtle right now. You know, he, sorry, maybe a better <laughs> comparison is like, he's just, he's just like a fucking Charmander. There is a Charizard beyond that if he just grows a little. But it's also a bit of an opposites a track story as Yamada begins to have feelings for him too. Their connection comes from these two helping the other climb out of and overcoming their inner darkness. They're the shoulder for the other to cry on and the one who <laughs> Oh my god, cry on for sure. Season 2 bro, holy shit. We're 8 episodes deep, 6 out of 8, <laughs> just always crying. Some are very happy, but the crying is actually good because it shows how emotional and vulnerable she can become and how she comfortable she is around each car to do that. It makes the other a better person by opening opening them up to the dangers in, in my heart. heart. Title drop. Yeah, yeah, he said it, he said mm. it. Mm -hmm. And this is just such a sweet, sweet premise. Mom. A simple premise, but they excel this simplicity because of its relatability. We all have our own darkness and insecurities, and don't we all so desperately just want that someone special to help us through them? Yeah. I remember the cold times. I would cry into my crummy hugging pillow. Oh, yeah. crummy, why? Why will no one love me? Why can't you be... No one will probably love you because you have a crummy body pillar. I'm sorry. You're trying to bring a girl home and she doesn't know anything about anime. <laughs> she sees the body pillow. 
<laughs> what you gonna think? I'm sorry, man. Real. <sighs> she always came through for me, man. She always came through. <laughs> So we have established that the first area this anime smashes it out of the park is in its premise, but the next area is a huge make or break factor for a lot of anime out there, hmm? especially those trying to trend for as long as this has. And the dangers in my heart really brings it home here by nailing this second key area. It excels what is that? in its characters. And I know you're thinking, oh, characters, that's original, but I say I think that the representation of Yamada and Ichiko, again, as relatable young middle school kids, they're like 14, it's extremely relatable. And again, I love the fact that Yamada is not just a simple, static, idealized character that's just there to exist for the person watching to self-insert them into, right, as a power fantasy. She is her own unique person with her own ambitions, dreams, and insecurities, and, and everything about it just made for such great characterizations. Not just the male lead, but the female lead too. They F you, man. You just made my point. These characters are original. And while they share some common tropes with other anime characters, they still manage to feel unique. You can pick them out of the crowd, and the more you look at individual characters, the more special they become. We've got Ichikawa. The dude is an unpopular, edgy creep who fantasizes about murder. He lives rent-free inside his own head, and he's very bitter towards society, and overall, he's just a very awkward person. What he just summarized there is pretty much the perfectly crafted demographic, the male audience that watches this show, bro. <laughs> Just genuinely, it, that's, it, that's exactly that. Maybe if we take out the serial killing part, but that pretty much describes the exact audience that the anime industries for rom-coms are trying to market this product into so that they can self-insert themselves as a main character and feel relatable. And what does relatability do? It gets them more engaged. It gets them more enthusiastic about this show. DVD sales go up. Basically, he is you and me, apart from the murder fantasies. But if that's you, then cool. Mine tend to be about anime boobs, in all honesty, but you do you. Overall, Ichikawa is a total cringe lord, but he's a teenager, you know? Weren't we all cringe We're all lords cringe. at 13? Yep. Like, some of the shit I did or said back then, it still keeps me awake at night now. Oh, hey, you asleep yet? Nah, I'm just getting there though. Thanks, pal. Good, 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 good. Um, Before you do though, remember that time when... No! The beauty is he cheating on Kurumi with Ichinose? Sorry, not Ichinose. What's that girl's name? Orihime in Bleach. He, he was bringing up Bleach a couple times saying it's his waifu. The of Ichikawa's character is that deep down, despite the cringe, he's the hero we all want to be. Though he worries about the attention being on him, he does stand up for what he feels is right. He dislikes those inconsiderate of others' feelings, you know, people who bully and those who treat others as objects. Honestly, I think that Senpai, while I don't really like him as a character, Senpai really existed as a catalyst to move Ishikawa forward. Every time Senpai was in an episode, there was something that he would try to do to get closer to Yamada. And every time Ishikawa would respond in a way that I would never expect to. He's just like this 10 times multiplier in getting the plot going. Kinda, Moiko did that shit too a lot in the beginning of season 2. Objects. Overall, Ichikawa is a good guy, and it's his progression through the story that really draws us in. As anime fans and nerds in general, we're all like Ichikawa in a sense. Then we have Yamada. Yeah, I think that even if you're not just like Ichikawa, I think that everyone has like a component of them where they're reminded of some of Ichikawa's behaviors. Ichikawa in a sense. Then we have Yamada. God damn, do we have Yamada. Like, and between you and me, I would kill a man for that girl. Hey, okay. would you look at that? I really am Ichikawa. Yamada is beautiful. She is cute. She is infectious. She is, well, she's a model. The main thing that comes to mind when it comes to Yamada is that damn does this girl pack away the candy. I mean, the amount of snacks this girl consumes is just insane. Like, it's crazy. Crepes. This girl is a fashion model, an actress. She has to be looking after that figure. So where is all the weight going from these snacks? Height, high metabolism, blessed with that. Snacks. Oh, yeah, of course. It goes straight into those legs of hers. Of course, Yamada is pretty tall, to be fair. Like, how tall is she, actually? Five foot seven. I, I 
it's not that she's well a five foot seven japanese girl in middle school is pretty fucking tall but i'd argue it's that the other people are shorter I honestly thought she was taller than that so how, yeah it's because ichikawa's like four foot nothing how small is ichikawa then five foot no five foot the straight up five foot right. there's an oh so he did get like a two inch growth spurt <laughs> five foot two five foot two let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you are trying to battle between, like, if you're like five foot two, let's let's like five foot two as a reference point. This this spoiler doesn't even fucking matter. It's a two inch growth spurt. <laughs> if you're five, let's let's bump it up to five foot four. Right? The difference between five foot four and five foot six, there's like fucking nothing. Okay, the girls. If you're not above like six foot. <laughs> Everyone below, y'all are just fighting over just midgets. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you need to all band together as short kings. <laughs> like you can't look down on other people that's shorter than you by two inches if you're fucking five foot four or five foot two, dude. All the girls that only look for height don't even see you as men. Uh, the wiki must be wrong. There's an obvious difference between the two as Ichikawa's face is always up in Yamada's chest when the two mm. are stood up straight. Right where I want to be, yo. Whoa. So I guess if this is true, then the secret we've learned here today is to find a girl seven inches taller than you. If you can't work out inches by face value, then she has to be at least four inches bigger than your... Now, the thing about Yamada's character that really makes her shine is her personality and how she makes it come across so strongly in the anime. The majority of the show is narrated through Ichikawa's inner monologues. Yeah. He is the main voice of the anime, and yet Yamada's character still manages to shine through by doing simple things, you know, her actions, her mannerisms, or through cute noises or gestures. Very cute. With Yamada, you can clearly tell her motives and feelings by these small and simple cues, and this allows the anime to show us viewers just how much of a best girl that she really is. I hope he'll talk about how she's like very different from a lot of the rom-com waifus that I've seen, and I've seen a lot of fucking rom-com. Many of you think that this is just a fucking shitty isekai channel. No, I've seen probably more rom-com than isekai from my old channel. And I, it's rare that a girl gets developed like this. Again, most of the girls, they're just kind of existing as just perfect characters, idealized forms. Sometimes they'll, they'll delve into a little bit of like the personal shit, but most of the times it's from the perspective of a guy that's trying to like grow as he meets this perfect girl that just saves him. And this is not that show. This is not that show. They actually give a fuck about Yamada. She's not just the cutout poster girl that you're supposed to self insert yourself into as a main character. She's very like dynamic. Is. Now, of course, the anime also has other characters in it, but what I really love about the dangers in my heart is that these characters are all NPCs and they know their damn place. What? Really? When you say NPC, I'm thinking about random fucking pedestrians on the street. These are side characters that collectively help bring out the world and potentially even push Ichikawa into more plot progression. I'm not sure if he's joking. NPCs and they know their damn place. We get enough information about them to like them as characters, but they only serve to tie stories together between Ichikawa and Yamada. They never take the main focus away from them, rather- Yeah, because they're side characters. I don't think he's joking about them being NPCs right now. But they appear to either strengthen one of their characters, to be used as part of a gag, or to be used as a purpose for the two main characters to be in a situation together. They are there to serve the story, yeah. not take us out of it. And I really like that. They obviously enhance. Side characters are meant to, you know, add a little bit more mystique, because they're not, you rarely see them, right? Arashi's mom, I don't know anything about her. She's like the fucking shanks of this show. The proportion of amount of screen time shown versus the hype, the inverse correlation. Arachi's mom is one of those people. There's other people. Like Ishikawa's Yamada's dad. You know, the sister actually is shown a lot more time. I think that these characters exist to kind of obviously expand the world, but at the same time, heighten the portrayal of the main female and male leads. Now, before we move on to the final point, do you know what the craziest thing about this anime trending number one all season is? that there's other really hype shows airing at the same time. And before we get to there, 
I think that it makes sense why season two is doing so well. Because like, I, I doubt that, I wonder if season one also did that well. Because season two can only be so good because of the foundation set in season one. And season one, obviously a little bit of slow start and then it got really good. But season two was already, it's like, basically it's the Shibuya incident arc of Dangers in My Heart. As in, they can already go in and just give you peak after peak after peak because of the foundations that's been set. Do you want to know what makes this even more impressive of a feat? Well, what? it's a season two. Tradi Usually they get filtered out. Yes, the point here is that obviously a big people, like if you think about a big circle, right? What happened? Think about circles. You have a big pool of people coming into season one. After pe most, uh, most of those people in the initial circle, they don't all stick around for season one. They drop it after a while. And then you have a smaller circle as you finish season one. And then you have even a smaller circle as you go to season two. This is just the behavior of audience as we, you know, go to next season. It's just filtering. But despite that, the fact that Dangerous in My Heart was still that good shows that the retention of the filtering, right? There was less of that. There was more retention for people coming from season one to season two. And season two was also peak on top of that. Additionally, unless you are one of these big shonen anime, your season 2 ends up pretty much left on the side of the road. You know, that dark part of your watch list. Whoa, why both of you getting done dirty? You feel all the guilt about. It's that game you pick up with all intention of earning that beautiful platinum trophy. The story was great, what an amazing game. But then it is left unfinished because there is another shiny game <laughs> out that everyone is talking about. However, this is not the dangers in my heart, man. No, this is trending so hard because it executes this part of the story so damn well. Key area number three, the journey. They have made the journey between Ichikawa and Yamada getting closer so damn addictive that I'm sure the UK government is going to whack a bunch of tax on it. Season 1 was just- Many of you think, and this is the funniest thing, and let me get a little real for you. Let me get a little real for you for a second. A lot of people are like, <laughs> Kaka TV is posting 2-3 to three dangers in my heart reactions per day. What happened, bro? I thought that you wouldn't like this. I guess bro got addicted. <laughs> and I read that shit and I'm like, you fucking retards. This is a detour. Do you think that I actually give a fuck about this show? I do. It's a very enjoyable show. I do love dangers in my heart. It's a very fun watch. But the reason that this is happening... It's so that we can go and marathon ReZero season 1 and 2 in time before October. Season 3 can show up. This is, that's the main course meal. This is the appetizer. So like, don't get ahead of yourselves. I hate it when, comp I hate it when like ignorant, complacent, fucking cocky monkeys come in. Getting all snarky as if they know better. Without even being aware what the purpose of Dangers in My Heart is. It's a fucking pit stop. It's a fucking detour. Yes, I'm going to give it my all and give my best reactions I can and enjoy this show. But like, let's get serious. <laughs> Y'all don't know what's coming. Just the beginning. That only introduced us to these two characters and made us feel like we wanted them to be together. They kept their feelings to themselves and tiptoed around each other when it came to making a move. The whole mood was, I like them, but I don't think they'd ever see me in that way. This and it's perfect because that's something everybody can relate to. Anyone, middle school, high school, beyond that, even college, beyond that, right? It's this feeling of, oh, I want to confess, but if I do, then what happens to this current relations that we have? This ties back to the relatability aspect that this anime does so well. The dangers in my heart, season two, the gloves are off and we are hardcore getting these feelings out there. The guards of these two characters is lowered and we are seeing their intimate side. At this point, we know Ichikawa and Yamada as if they were freaking family. We are invested in them and their love. Heck, I think we want it harder than they do at this point. Probably, the way yeah. To which these two are growing together is probably one of the most wholesome journeys I've witnessed in a row. And that's the thing, wholesome journey. I love how an anime that doesn't have to stoop down to cheap fucking etchy fan service to appease the horny kids watching it can succeed like this while other etchy shows are airing. Nothing wrong with being etchy. Nothing wrong with gushing over magical girls. But like, sometimes it just feels like y'all are just watching it to just jack off. 
this anime does not need any of that. It's simply a good story. It's a good anime. Romance anime. It's up there for sure. With the foreplay of season one left behind us, each and every week of its second season is giving us the real juicy stuff, and it's been executed to near perfection. We're getting the major moments and the huge plays, as this is heavily concentrating on the raw emotion these two are feeling, and it's the sweetest, most fuck. It's the most diabetes show ever. Mom! Now, I honestly see the dangers in my heart continuing to trend at number one for the rest of this season, and that's because it's a killer romance story. But what are we going to do when next season comes around and this show isn't airing anymore? Well, then we're just going to cover a shitload of other fucking animes and... <laughs> This anime got fucking butchered. Listen, no offense to anyone that actually likes this show. I heard that the scheduling just fucking ruined this show by the end. Remember this? The Yuri anime? <laughs> Anyways, that's it for me. Thank you, 414 Anime, for sharing your thoughts about the dangers of my heart. Please go check out his channel. Like this video and sub to him if you haven't. But I agree. I think that Dangers in My Heart is such a fantastic rom-com. I've seen a lot of rom-coms. What you see right now is just a glimmer, a glimpse of what you see is like the tip of the iceberg. I've seen so many rom-coms, bro, and I'm honestly fucking tired of it. But I can confidently say Dangers in My Heart is in that tier of greatness, that tier zero, the peak S tier, along the likes of Kaguya-sama Love is War. You gotta let Roshitera cook a little bit more. I think Roshitera will be there. And my personal bias makes me love Tomo-chan as a girl so much that I put that shit up there too. But Dangers in My Heart, I can confidently say it is one of the best, best uh, rom-coms that I personally seen and I personally enjoyed. And we still have four more episodes to finish off the season. And I know that I'm going to want a season three, unless they finish the season like that. I doubt they will. Surely there's a season three that's going to come out, right?